Good morning to the Commonwealth. This is Young Honey with Raw Dog Radio, bringing you the greatest old-time radio station since the bombs fell. We're going to be hitting you with an arrangement of ragtime on a bridge stories and other old world medias. I'd like to send a specific thank you to publicdomainreview.org and archive.org for organizing and compiling all of this media. Now, without further commentary, we're starting off with Frontier Gentlemen, a late 1950s story collection by John Denton. The great chief of the Sioux Indians is Sitting Bull. He is a rather difficult chap to meet, especially when he's planning for war. Frontier Gentlemen. Here with an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual accounts. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. Now starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. The distance from South Sunday to Rosebud in Montana Territory is about 30 miles. Due to a heavy rainstorm and my lack of funds, it had taken me a week to reach Rosebud. Luckily, when I arrived, my remittance from England, $250, had already been forwarded and I was once again solvent. After posting off my weekly report to the London Times, I went to the most likely place in Rosebud to get local color and information. Except for the bartender polishing his glasses and a cat on the bar, The place was quite empty. I ordered a drink. Two bits. Thank you. It's all right. Hush up, cat. Where are you from, mister? London. London, England? That's right. Well, if that don't beat all, my great-grandpa come from there. Uh Yeah, Jackson Beeson's the name. J.B. Kendall. Well, howdy. How do you do, sir? Uh, Tell me, Mr. Beeson... What's the situation with the Indians these days? Well, now you come to the right place for that bit of news. Oh, get away, cat. Yes, sir, we're going to have trouble. You can thank your stars that we got General Gibbon here keeping an eye out. I hear tell Custer's on his way, too. Oh, bad as that, huh? Worse. Well, just yesterday, correspondence fellow like you, he come in, works on the Montana Telegraph News. Uh, Jackson, he says, them Sioux is working up to a boil. Oh, it's going to be wicked. Mighty wicked. Do you think it'll mean war? I don't have to think. I know. I get... You can't. Get out of here. Go on. Get out. Get out. Get out. <laughs> Darn cats. A regular drunkard. Uh, uh, this correspondent chap, is he still here? Charlie Meeker? Oh, sure. He's around somewhere. I'd like to meet him. Right nice fella. Uh, now, let's see. You might try up to Dolly's place. Cross the street there. Second house on the right. Can't miss it. Just ask for Charlie. He rooms at Dolly's. Thanks very much. Mm-hmm. And, uh, look, if he ain't there, I'll tell him you're looking for him when he comes back. Uh, you stop by tonight. Right. Well, hello, early bird. Uh, good afternoon, uh, madam. <laughs> uh, this this is, is Dolly's place? Why, sure it is. You come on in. Uh. It's nice and warm inside, honey. Uh, yeah, I- I'm looking for a gentleman named Charles, Charles Meeker. Charlie, what do you want with him? Oh, well, I was told I could find him here. The bartender... Oh, of... Jack Beeson sent you. Yes. Well, all right. Well, step inside. I'm freezing my... Mary! Go wake up, Charlie. There's a fella here to see him. I guess you better wait in the parlor. Say, now, I hope you'll forgive the looks of this room. Some of the boys got a little rowdy last night. <laughs> uh, we haven't cleaned it up yet. Not at all. Charming. You're new in Rosebud, ain't you? Uh, yes. Well, that's nice. That's real nice. I can see you're a gentleman. It's always nice to meet a gentleman. Uh, sit down. Make yourself comfortable. Mr. Uh, Kendall. 
Well, Mr. Kendall, you're a friend of Charlie's, huh? No. No, we've never met. Well, he's a nice boy. He's real nice. He sure never forgets me. Any time he's in these parts, he brings old Dolly a present. Uh, can I get you a drink? No, thanks just the same. Hey, uh, you ain't a dominie, are you? Uh, dom? A preacher? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I sure do admire to hear you talk. I wish you'd say something else. Somebody um, looking for me, darling. Oh, this here is Mr. Kendall, Charlie boy. All right. How do you do, sir? Well, you've got business to talk, so make yourselves at home. It's sure been a pleasure, Mr. Kendall. Maybe you'll call again. Thank you very much. You know, I have to excuse me, Kendall. I just woke up. Big knife. Oh. And a big head. What can I do for you? I understand you write for a newspaper, Mr. Meeker. Charlie. Yeah, Virginia City, Montana Telegraph now. I know. I do some correspondence myself for the London Times. Hey, I'm proud to meet you. May I return the compliment? Uh, look here. Is it true what I've been hearing, these rumors about a Sioux uprising? Yeah, more than rumors. It's coming. Well, this chief, Sitting Bull, have you ever seen him? Once. A few years back. Big council between one of our government commissions and the Indian. Oh, I'd like to meet him. See him, you know? No, not a chance. Not anymore. A while ago, maybe, but... Those Indians don't trust the white man now. I tell you, they're getting ready for war. Is there any way to make contact with him? Probably. There are plenty of Indian scouts, interpreters hereabouts. It could, but yeah, for a white man, it'd be worth his scalp. How would one go about it? Are you serious? Completely. Do you know where I could find him? Uh, I got a pretty good idea. You want a drink? No, thank you. There's talk of a whole lot of Indians moving off the reservations, going up Tongue River country. Might be headed for Sitting Bull's camp. How far would that be? 30 miles, maybe. <laughs> now, listen, mister. When the Sioux go on the warpath, the best place for you and me is someplace else. Well, do you think you could find me one of those Indian scouts? Someone to guide me to Sitting Bull's camp? You mean it, don't you? Absolutely. What a story. Interview with Chief Sitting Bull? Oh, it's crazy. They'd kill us, Sure. No, Kendall, the best thing for you is to talk to some of the old-timers. They'll tell you about him, and then you can send your report in on that. It's a whole lot safer. That evening in Beeson's saloon, Charlie Meeker found a half-breed interpreter, Johnny Duchel. He was a big man, dark, with handsome features, and when he smiled, which he did constantly, there was something at odds in his eyes, veiled, a coldness. He is playing a game of solitaire, and as he dealt his cards, I noticed that inside his sleeve was a wrist holster. Strapped to it, a derringer. You want to talk with Sitting Bull? That's right, Johnny. Him too? Me too. Suppose he don't want any talk with you. Suppose he want to take your scalp. <laughs> that would be rather awkward. Johnny, how well do you know the chief? How well does any man know another? Charlie says you've done scouting work for General Crook. Well... Doesn't that make you Sitting Bull's enemy? Yesterday I scout for the soldier. Tomorrow maybe I fight with the Indian. Who knows? Yes. Well, the point would seem to be, whose side are you on if you do guide us? If I do this thing, you put your trust in me. I see. Well, what do you say, Johnny? Can you take us to him? Uh, black ace on the red two. Yeah. You got fifty dollars? Silver? Kind of high, isn't it? Sitting bull, one big chief. You want me to take you to Red Cloud, crazy horse? Maybe cost less. What do you think, Ken? I'm not sure. Maybe you find somebody, do it for less. he take you to Indian, cut out your heart, huh? Now Johnny's all right. Twenty-five apiece would be worth it. All right. When, Johnny? Tomorrow. Fine. Take no guns. Hey, wait a Indians minute. Indians see you with guns, they say you coming for no good. Without guns, in peace. No guns. It's sort of risky, isn't it, Johnny? Not with me along with you. What time? We meet outside the state station. Six o'clock. See you then. Well, you still want to go? I'm not sure about that fellow. That's a chance you take these days. We can back out. No. 
But to be on the safe side, Charlie, I think two guns in shoulder holsters would make me feel a bit better. Sure, you got them? Never use a gun myself. Oh. oh, yes, yes, I've got them. Look here, Charlie. Now, this is my idea. No need for you to come along, you know. What's the matter? You want the story for yourself? No, no, not that at all. I'm sorry. I only thought that... Forget it. We'll go together. Hey, how about coming over to Dolly's with me for a nightcap? Uh, no, thanks. Not tonight. Sleep for me. Oh. Well, see you in the morning. We can pick up horses at the livery stable. So long. I watched him walk away, a rather short, thin man, shoulders a little rounded. And then he was lost in the shadows, and I had that odd sensation of having lived this moment before. It had been in Peshawar, in northern India. I remembered a good friend who had walked away from me in the night. The next morning, his head was thrown through the barracks window. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Laugh and the world laughs with you. Cry and say, where'd everybody go? Chances are they've taken off in the direction of CBS Radio's Peter and Mary show. Peter Lind Hayes and Mary Healy have a magic way of banishing the blues. Their amusing notions about practically everything, the easy way they sing their songs, and the exciting personalities who visit them all make CBS Radio's Peter and Mary show a cure for the blues. Listen for them on most of these same stations tomorrow. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of... Frontier Gentlemen. The morning was gray, a bit windy. We left Rosebud at six o'clock and rode steadily toward the southeast. I could see no sign of a gun on our guide, Johnny Duchelle, but his bulky jacket could have hidden an arsenal. For perhaps over an hour, we didn't speak. Charlie, red-eyed from want of sleep and too much whiskey, nodded in his saddle. The half-breed traveled a little ahead of us, cautious, watchful. Hey, Kendall. Yes? Never drink Dolly's rot gut. <laughs> I won't. I can take the pepper, even the tobacco juice she puts in it, but that whiskey... <laughs> You know, we had a cure for your complaint in India. Oh? Cherry powder, ginger, a snake's head, preferably a cobra, a big spoon of sugar, stew the whole thing in a pot of strong tea, and then drink it down. <laughs> exactly. It's a miraculous cure. You'd probably end up chucking the whole mess out the window, but you forgot your headache. What were you doing in India? Army, mostly. Officer? At one time, Captain... See much fighting? Enough. Oh, you with? Uh, the cavalry regiment. You don't like to talk about it much, do you? <laughs> no, not much. Hey, better hold up. Johnny's seen something. In timber. Cheyenne, I think. You stay. I talked to them. How many? Can you see? Five or six. Might be others in the woods. Hey, you know something funny? I'm scared. I think about your headache. No, thanks. Too close to my hair. You ever see a scalp man? No. But I shouldn't worry. The tribesmen do much nastier things to get their trophies in India. Jenny must know them. Look. <laughs> All very friendly. Hello. They must have given their blessings. You think so? Either that or Johnny has made an arrangement with them to cut our throats. He looks happy enough. That tall wolf and his brave. They will ride to the council. Tell of our coming. Glad to hear it. We go on now. Johnny smiled, turned away, and we rode on. I had the distinct feeling that he knew exactly what he was doing, and we didn't. Another hour passed. If there were more Indians about, we didn't see them. The terrain was becoming more rugged, and when we reached a narrow stream, Johnny called a halt. We rest the horses. All right. I think I'll get myself a drink. Water, that is. Funny we haven't seen any more Indians, Johnny. They all had great counsel. Mm. 
You seem pretty sure we won't be attacked. I told Tall Wolf you come in peace. And possibly there are others beside Tall Wolf who won't feel as he does. Possibly. We see at the council. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not worried, though. I am not worried. You're smiling. Good for a man to smile. <laughs> Depends on his reason. I smile because you paid me 50 silver dollars to bring you here. Ah. Uh, tell me, Johnny, what will it cost to take us back? The cost to you will not matter. I think you will not be going back. He made a slight movement with his hand, and a derringer appeared in it. For a moment, I had forgotten his wrist holster. He was standing no more than four feet from me, and I didn't move. If you've ever seen what a 41 derringer can do to a man, you'd understand. Then he brought out a revolver from his jacket and backed away a few steps. That was when I saw Charlie at the stream. He had a rock in his hand, his arm cocked back. At the moment he threw it, the half-breed turned and saw him. Where are you hit? Charlie. Chest. Boy, that feels worse than Dolly's rot gut. He's not dead? No, I'm not dead, you stinking breed. You, Kendall, take off your jacket. Ah. Uh. Now, untie those shoulder holsters. Let them fall to the ground. Uh. Move back. Uh. Stop. Uh. You both got more silver. Give uh. it to me. I'll spit in your eye first. I told Tall Wolf, I take you to Sitting Bull as my prisoner, alive. He will think well of me, give uh. me place of trust. Uh. Your own mother wouldn't trust you, Johnny. Uh. With much silver, two horses, even a stinking breed will be important man. Uh. Give it to me. You'll find a bag in my jacket. Uh. Good. Now, you both, you walk. I ride behind. Can you get up, Charlie? Sure. Yeah, I'll help you. Uh, ah. It's my fault. I should have done something sooner. I wasn't sure about him. Uh. Walk. Uh. Cross the street. Follow the trail. Come on. Lean on me. Uh, 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 I, I can't. I can't go on anymore. <coughs> he is dead. Let me put him on a horse. He called me stinking breed. Let him walk. He can't. He's done in. Then you carry him. Let him rest for a minute. A minute. Charlie. Charlie, can you hear me? Uh -huh. Listen to me, Charlie. The trail narrows a few yards along. There's a slope on our left. Uh -huh. Do you hear me, Charlie? Yeah. I'm going to let you fall. If I can get him to take his eyes off me, there's a knife in my boot. All right. Good luck. All right, Charlie. Up you come. Ah. <laughs> Getting close, Charlie. Now, when you fall, mm. keep your head down in case he starts shooting. What a way to die. I could... I could... Hit Dolly's right now. When we get back alive, I'll join you. Now, about <laughs> ten more steps, Charlie. Mm. Mm. Now, Charlie. Ah! For a moment, I had a glimpse of Charlie sliding, falling down the hill slope. Then he disappeared into the underbrush. I turned to face Johnny Duchel, the knife in my hand. Johnny was standing in his stirrups, craning his head to see over the trail's edge. He was no more than 15 feet from me. There must have been a horse shifting its weight to disturb my aim. I threw... And the knife struck high on his shoulder. He half fell from the saddle, and I ran for him. I felt one of the bullets from his gun burn my cheek. Then we were rolling down the hill. Somewhere on the way, he lost the gun, but the, the knife was stabbing. Cut it, bitch.
Charlie. Uh, Charlie! It's all right. It's all right, Charlie. He's finished. He's finished. Something tells me we don't get to see sitting bull today. Better luck next time. Hey, Kendall. Whiskey's paid for. But I owe Dolly for room and board. It's only... Charlie. Charlie. I took Charlie back to Rosebud, to Dolly's place. She had me put the little man on the parlor couch. Then she knelt by his side, took his hand in hers. Charlie, boy, it's Dolly. This was my place, I missed you. Like the one I never had. My good, bad boy. Dolly misses you, Charlie boy. Wake up, son. <laughs> Most of Rosebud attended the funeral of Charles Nika. I sent the story to his own newspaper, as well as to the London Times. And for Charlie... I decided to stay on in Rosebud to have another shot at a meeting with Sitting Bull. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Lawrence Dobkin, Harry Bartell, and Junius Matthews. Music was composed by Jerry Goldsmith and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Later today, you'll have five more engrossing dramas waiting for you on CBS Radio, starting with Suspense, which today stars Herbert Marshall. You can look forward to plenty of action and plenty of thrills with yours truly, Johnny Dollar, the FBI in Peace and War, Indictment, and Gunsmoke. For good listening, keep listening to CBS Radio. Now, stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. Johnny Jacobs speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. There are places west of the Missouri where gambling stakes are rather high. This is particularly true when the wager depends on a man's life. Frontier Gentlemen. Herewith, an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual story. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territory. Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. <laughs> Thank you. 
I had stayed in Montana Territory hoping for an interview with Sitting Bull or even Crazy Horse. But General Crook's attack across the Tongue River put an end to that hope, at least for the time being. And so, with a full-fledged Indian war exploding around me, I had no choice but to remain where I was. The settlement with a normal population of perhaps a hundred had swollen to four times that number. The saloon keeper, gambler, and others were doing a thriving business. And the, the most popular spot in town was undoubtedly a place bearing the rather, oh, sanguinary legend, Jug of Blood. It was what is known as a honky-tonk. I was passing outside when the trouble began. The doors flew open and half a dozen brawling men erupted in the street. In sheer self-defense, I became a combatant. <laughs> My dear fellow, I haven't the slightest idea. Yeah. You could buy that. Yeah. Jolly good. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's just some no good son of a gun was cheap at poker. And no good son of a gun. Really? Yeah. Uh, one of those? Uh, uh, how should I know I wasn't playing? I just heard it all. Yeah. You know, if there's anything I hate, it's uh, no good cheating. Son of a gun. Yes. Bad form. Uh, I don't blame you. Hey, well, what's your hurry? now, if you'll pardon me. Hey, come on in and have a drink. No, I don't think so. Thank you. Oh, come on. There's mighty pretty little gals in there. Yeah. You know, Jake Hunter hired them all the way out from back east. It was on the way up to Virginia City. Uh, Sue Ruckus has held him old. I'm sorry to hear it, but now, really, I must be going. Oh, mister, you ain't seen such dancing, such carrying on. I'll be a son of a gun if I'll let you move on without seeing the nicest bit of female woman of flesh this side of St. Louis. Son of a gun, come on, let's go. You won't be sorry. <laughs> J.B. Kendall, Mr. Smith. Howdy. Hey, what are you drinking? Oh, I'll take a beer if you don't mind. Oh, it'll make no never mind to me. Jake? Yeah? A beer from a pound of whiskey for me. Tell Andy to bring him over. Okay. J.B. Kendall, huh? J.B. Hey, you any kin to Arizona Kendall's down at Tombstone? No. What's your business, mister? I'm inside from fight. I'm a newspaper correspondent. Oh, well, I'm a cow puncher myself. Got paid off last week. This here's a good place to spend your money. <laughs> hey, how do you like that there picture over the bar? Ain't she something? <laughs> there's quite a bit of her, isn't there? What'd you say? I say there's quite a bit of her, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. A little out of proportion here and there. Ample. Well, son of a gun, I like you, Kendall. <laughs> I like you. Son of a gun. Hey, what paper you write for? London Times. Well, son of a gun. Hey, Annie. Hiya, Mrs. Smith. Hey, hey sweetheart. This here is J.B. Kendall. Hi. You write for a newspaper, London Times. He's an important man. Now, you go call Crystal. Now, drinks are on me. Yeah, Mrs. Smith. Hi, Crystal. <laughs> yeah, me, I go for the nice fat one. There's something you can grab a hold on. Never did like dancing with them skin and bone gals. I gather Annie is your choice, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's some looker up. Oh, no doubt of it, Mr. Smith. Of course, now, there ain't nothing wrong with Crystal. She's the one close herding with that son of a gun, Bill Bass. Oh, yeah. See? I said um, I don't think he is taking kindly to your friend Annie's suggestion. Uh, he's a raunchy buzzard, ain't he? He's drunker than all. Um, I say, uh, look here, old boy. We don't want to cause any more trouble. You and your young lady have a nice evening. I'll be running along. Oh, sit down. Huh? I owe you for that fight. I always pay my debt. Well, here they come. Ladies, me 
meet J.B. Kent. Uh, this here is Crystal, J.B. Crystal, how do you do? Go on, sit in the glass, sweetheart. The poor uh, fellow ain't feeling his oats yet. Well, well, no, I, I'm, I'm sure Miss Crystal will be much more comfortable in a chair. Come here, Randy. Come here, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, would you, um, be careful a drink? No, thanks. Oh. Uh, the, the, the gentleman you were dancing with, uh, he seems rather upset. Him? Oh. Are you sure I can't get you something? What's the matter? You don't like me? Ain't I good enough to sit in your lap? Oh, no, not at all. I, I'd be delighted, oh, but... Uh, but yeah. I'm Wild Bill Bascom, and ain't no man nor dog would take my gal away from me. You riding hurt on Crystal I'm Bell? I'm riding hurt on no one. But I paid good hard cash, and I'm going to have my dance out. You go rattle hocks out of here. And I say good hockey to you, all I. Gentlemen, I think the language is getting a trifle right. After all, there are ladies present. Well, who are you, you son of a gun? The name is Kendall. Well, good hockey to you, You Kendall. have your ride, mister. I ain't dancing no more with you. We'd like to stop I'll my feet off, Mr. Kendall. I rather, think, I rather think it's up to the lady. Don't you, chum? Lady? She ain't no lady. Bill. Son of a gun. Bill, I'm right. giving you one second to rattle hawks out, and then I'm going to blow your ears off. No, 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 no. Oh, no need of that, are. Mr. Smith. You'll go along quietly, won't you, Mr. Baskin? Oh, you think you're a pretty big son of a gun, don't you? Well, you don't stampede me, mister. Now, come on, girl. Oh, not at all polite. Yeah. Uh, hey, you're breaking my heart. Then, then be a good chap, and as Mr. Smith puts it, go rattle your heart. Ain't no son of a gun telling me what to do. I'm Wild Bill Baskin. Look out, he's coming, he's coming. Gun. You killed me. What's he mean, you killed him? He shot himself. You didn't even draw on him. Now, I don't allow no gun shooting in here. Uh, Jake, it's Bill Baskin. He aimed to salivate Mr. Kendall here, and he killed himself instead. Oh, that silly son of a gun. Now, you boys, you get him up out of there. That that rug cost me three hundred dollars. Will somebody get a doctor? He's not dead. Yeah, I bet he is. How much you bet, Mister? He ain't dead. I seen him move. Look. Why don't you shut your mouth? I'll get him off my rug. Take him in back. You can put him on the faro table. Give me a hand. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Somebody find a doctor, please. Ain't no doctor except my army surgeon. He's getting himself scalped by his shoe. Well, that shoe uh, ain't no doctor around here. Uh, I never knew Carefully now. Heavy. Carefully. All right, break up the game, boys. There's a corner here. Needs a table. Come on, brother. I tell you, all right, all right, boys. Put him down. I'm dying, boy. Give me a drink. I'll get it. Put him down, I said. Put him down. All right, he's there. Oh. My old Martin. See me now. Any? See if you can find some bandages. Clean rag, hot water. Sure. And don't you fret, Bill. Right. You're going to be just fine. Well, i got to get back to the bar. Anything you boys need, you let me know. Whiskey's on the house, Batman. You're a good man, Jay. I'll put in a word for you when I get where I'm going. Yeah, well, you do that. So long. All right, now. Let's get that jacket off, Batman. Oh. Mister, you treat me like I, I don't deserve it. Don't talk now. Smith, get the other arm. Uh, sure. Hey. No, I'm not. Now, wait a minute. Now, look, I, I ain't kidding you. These are my dying words. I... <coughs> I tried to kill you. Uh, In my drink, I, I, I tried to, but it's heavy on my conscience. Well, I sure wish I had me a preacher to make my peace with. Bill, will you shut your uh, son of a gun mouth and let us get this here no, jacket off of yeah. you? I ain't... Careful uh, 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 now. There we are. And I'll have to tear the shirt. No. No, boy. This is my my best shirt. I I want to be buried in it. Here's the whiskey, Bill. Let me hey. chop his head up. Crystal, you angel of mercy. That, that's what you are, Crystal. You. Crystal. 
Crystal girl, I'm asking your forgiveness, sweetheart. <laughs> I acted purely like a boom tail with you. Forget it, Bill. Finish your drink. Doesn't look mean, don't it, Mr. Smith. Kim? Smith, Smith, come over here. Yeah, mm-hmm. right Just hold it still. I reckon he ain't got long. You know, if he don't bleed to death, it's gangrene for sure. Now, we can stop the bleeding, I think. But we've got to get that bullet out. Oh, ain't nobody around here crazy enough to try that. Ain't no sense carving up the poor son of a gun. Let him die comfortable like He doesn't have to die. There might be a chance. Will you help? Help what? Operate on him. You're loco. There's nothing to lose. How about another drink, boy? I'm going fast. All right, Mr. Kim. Give him all he wants, Crystal. Keep pouring it into him. Now you think it's fitting for a man to die yes. drunk? I think it's fitting for a man not to feel any more pain than he has to. What you doing with that knife? I told you I'm going to take that bullet out of him. If you want to help me, good. If not, you'll oblige me by rattling your hocks out of here. <laughs> moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Poor Jack Benny. The gang arranges a surprise party for him on his birthday. But the surprise backfires in a hilarious way today on CBS Radio's Jack Benny program. Never mind the greeting cards. Forget about buying him a present. Just be sure to join us on most of these same stations later on today when everybody has a good time at Jack Benny's birthday party, except Jack himself. And now we return you to Anthony Ellis' production of Frontier Gentlemen. There are some men who possess a rather odd sentimentality about pain and death. They don't hesitate to empty a gun into a living body. With clear and shining conscience, they do this deed. But for those same men to retrieve a life, to cut into flesh to do so, that is a different matter. Walleye Smith was of this type. The thought of operating on Bill Bascom offended his sense of delicacy. Oh, you ain't no doc. You can't do that. I can bloody well try. I couldn't find no bandages, so I tore a sheet up. And here's your water. Good girl. Put it down on the table. Now, which one of you ladies will help? I will. Oh, sure. Me too. All right. We'll try to stop the bleeding first. How do you feel, Bill? I'm dying, partner. How about another drink? Annie. Sure. Crystal, take some sheeting. Press it over the wound. Keep holding it there. Now, come on. The son of a gun, Kendall. I say you can't do it. My dear fellow, will you step over here for a moment? Now. Now, Smith, look here. The fact that Bascom might die is partially my fault. How come? He shot himself. Circumstances. Excuse me. Well, you ain't no doc. So you said. You'll kill him. If we're lucky, I won't. If a man's luck runs out, that's the end. Don't pay to go again, nature. At a less pressing moment, I should be delighted to enter into a philosophical discussion with you, Smith, but not just now. Now, be a good chap and don't argue. But I ain't arguing, you son of a gun. I'm telling you, you ain't going to cut Bill up. Smith, I took you for something more than a thick-headed clodhopper. I see I was mistaken. Oh, mister, you go on talking like that, there's going to be another dying man in here. Oh, dear. Awfully sorry. <coughs> out and stay out. Oh, son of a gun. Now, how's our patient? Finish half the bottle. There's enough rot got in him to melt that bullet. <laughs> Wishful thinking, my dear. Bill, I'm going to take the bullet out. You do. All right, Crystal. Take a handful of rags. And when I tell you, wipe the blood away. What do you want me to do? Hold his hand. Try to keep him still. Oh. Ready? Yes. Here we go. I didn't know how deeply the bullet had penetrated. I could only guess at its approximate direction. I made an incision. Ah, 
Uh, wife. There you see, son of a gun, carving them up like a piece of buffalo meat. Hey, you can't do that, mister. I'm doing it. Get out. A hundred said Bascom makes it. Who said that? Me. You're on. Wipe. He ain't breathing so good. I know. I'm... Will you get out? No, no, not me. I got money on Bill. Anybody else want to make a little bet? Yeah, 50. He's still alive in two hours. Odds on that, two get you one. You're fed. Wipe. Oh, why don't you go on out? We're trying to save him. You go right on trying, Annie. Anybody else? Well, I'd like maybe... Uh... Kendall, what do you think? Has he got a chance? How the devil should I know? Sure is a mess, ain't he? Hey, poor old Bill, he was a good man. Yeah, he sure could top a horse. Yeah. Jake, 200, he's still alive come 4 o'clock. Uh, it's midnight now. I'll take it. All right, now, Kendall, you son of a gun, you pull him through. You want a chance to win? Oh, well, sure I do. Get these people out. All right, come on, Jake. No, Everybody, no, 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 I'm staying. I got a big investment in that boy. Very well. I'm finished. You stay here. I won't go on. Let him die. I oh, see. Let him die. All right, all right, all right. We'll wait outside. Now, Walleye, you stay. You give us the word every five minutes. Well, sure. Uh, hold, 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 hold him down. Hold him. I got you, Billy boy. Yes. Rest easy. Easy. Uh, here. Now, I can't find it. I can't. Can't find it. Give me a rag, Crystal. Here. Thank you. Mm. Look at the color of him. He's going. Annie, give him whiskey. Quickly. Yeah. Yes. That's better. Uh. Oh. Ah. I can feel it. I, I, I can feel it. Yes. It's there. Yes, I've got it. White crystal. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Now, ain't that something? I never did see a piece of lead dug out before. Son of a gun. Hey, everybody, he got it out. Hey. And the son of a gun is still alive. Hey. We bound up the wound, made him as comfortable as we could. He'd lost a great deal of blood and was terribly weak. There was nothing to do now but wait. The two girls stayed in the room with me. And there was something very different about them. Both were far from being beautiful. But there was a softness, a quality of loveliness, which made their garish costume seem completely out of place. Howdy. Uh, how, how, how's he coming? Uh, about the same. You know, there's better than 10,000 been bed outside. 3.30 now, you, you think he'll live till 4? He might. I got 200, says he got to. Yeah, and obviously he's got to. <laughs> kind of funny if he does pull through, though, huh? It'll be a miracle. He ain't a bad son of a gun. Sure looks white. Quiet. Almost like a kid, don't he? Uh, anything I can do, Colonel. You say a prayer if you feel like it. Oh, I ain't a praying man, but I, I hope he makes it. Uh, not on account of my 200, I just hope he makes it. And for you, that's the prayer, Smith. <clears throat> You'll have a drink. No, no, thank you. Well, I, I, I'll go out and, and keep them all quiet. Yes, that's a good idea. Mister. Yes, Crystal. I know a prayer. You think it'd help? I don't know, it might. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the... Of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. For thou, For thou art, art with me. With... Thy rod and thy staff. Bastion. 
Bascom. Bill? Mm -hmm. How do you feel? Bill? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me, Bascom? I'm dying, boy. Give me a drink. Wild Bill Bascom didn't die. A number of people won money because of it, and a number of others lost. Mr. Smith insisted on dividing his winnings with me. During his presentation speech, he was so overcome that not once did he refer to me as a son of a gun, an omission I was happy to overlook. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Stacey Harris, Virginia Gregg, Eve McVeigh, Barney Phillips, and Charles Seal. Music was composed and conducted by Jerry Goldsmith. Bailey, Nat King Cole, and Eartha Kitt may not tell all to Mitch Miller tonight, but knowing Mitch as we do, we're sure his talented visitors will feel free to talk about anything and everything of interest. For an informal get-together with some of the brightest names in show business, hear the Mitch Miller Show every Sunday night on most of these same stations. Now stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentleman. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.